Okay, um, hello everybody. I'm Greg Swazer. I'm with the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar. Um, before we start, I need to uh, take a moment to say a couple of words here. So I just need to recognize that this webinar is occurring in a moment of deep sadness and concern and sadness at the murder of George Floyd, as well as the many before him, and unfortunately, probably many to come and concern for those in our South Minneapolis community and everywhere that has been vulnerable for generations and concern for our community right now that's undergoing a deeply traumatic experience. It's heartbreaking to watch the destruction of vulnerable communities, and our communities and see it spread throughout the country. So before we start, please join me in taking a breath for George Floyd um, and the countless others that can no longer do so. Okay, um, get going. Um, right, like I mentioned, I'm Greg Swazer. I work for the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. We are a program within the University of Minnesota Extension and our aim, our, our charge is to connect communities in greater Minnesota and organizations and individuals and people in greater Minnesota who are doing great sustainable development work and to connect them to the University of Minnesota resources. And so this deep winter greenhouse work over the past several years now has been an example of that where we've connected some innovative farmers and engineers and growers who've been experimenting with deep winter greenhouses and connected them to our uh, extension resources and our resources at the Center for Sustainable Building Research, and Solar Energy Lab and all around to try to increase the capacity of this technology and to help people around the, the state and the country become aware about it aware of it and uh, help people learn how to do this, build them and grow them. Um, Carol Ford is the pioneering deep winter greenhouse producer in Minnesota. Carol and her husband Chuck Wable wrote the Northlands Winter Greenhouse Manual and have been helping people learn how to build and use deep winter greenhouses for 15 years. Ford now works with the RSDP as the deep winter greenhouse program coordinator. Shane and Louise Johnson operate the Grandpa G's Farm in Pillager, Central Minnesota. Shane and Louise have been project partners with the RSDP's Deep Winter Greenhouse Initiative and have built and operated a Deep Winter Greenhouse 2.0 designed with the UMN, the University of Minnesota's Center for Sustainable Building Research. So now I will stop sharing and uh, ask Carol, you go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Um, so yes, as Greg said, I've been doing this for about 15 years now and have had the pleasure over the last seven years to be working with RSDP um, on the research that we're trying to do to make these greenhouses as efficient and profitable um, as they can be for anybody who wants to get into this. And there are going to be um, two webinars talking about the actual design of the facility. So what I'm talking about with the previous webinar that I did and today is to talk about what you do in there once you've built it. And there's, we're learning new things about that all the time. Um, but just to go through this briefly for anybody who is, is fairly new to this, some of the really um, basic parts of the design is that it needs to face south and the south wall's angle needs to match that of where the sun is at the depth of winter. So you're getting the maximum amount of light and heat energy as you can at the most challenging time. The sides and the back of the structure are heavily insulated and um, the thermal mass is below the structure. When, you, when Dan gets his webinars, you'll hear about some of the different ways we're looking at doing that. And also, it has to the back of it, you can see with this design where that little door is at the back, there's actually a space behind the greenhouse that functions as kind of an airlock as well as a storage area most often, um, so that you're never having direct access to the greenhouse from the outdoors because of course if it's minus 20, those um, salad greens don't, don't really want to be there any more than we do. And I want to let people know that all of the information that we have accumulated over the last few years is available on our website, including um, the blueprint for this 2.0 design. And coming soon, um, the new one that Dan will be talking about will be there too. 
And the hey, easiest Carol, way, yes. You aren't in the presentation mode. We're seeing like your smaller screen. Um, so oh. click, remember your little wine glass thing in the bottom corner? Wine glass thing. Yes. There you go. Okay. Oh, okay, good. Well, that's boring. Continue. Oh. Go to your next step. Yep. Okay, okay. Then, so where was I? Now we're just at your very front screen. So. Yeah, and so this just shows that we've had a lot of good support through grants to do the research that we are doing. The North Central SARE is um, a great supporter of ours, as is the Minnesota Department of Ag. And um, all of the information that you need on us, you can find by, um, I think Dan or Greg's also going to post the, the link for this, but the easiest way to find it, if you forget, is to just do a Google search on RSDP space DWG, and you will come to the website that we've got, and it's got every, um, the, all the results from the researches that we've done, different articles that we've found about winter production, um, again, the, the blueprints and all that kind of stuff. So uh, pretty much gives you everything that we've got to offer. It's all downloadable for free. So go for it. So one of the first things when I start talking about production in the deep winter greenhouse, there's just some basic principles I go by. And of course, um, this in the winter time, you're trying to maximize what you can grow in the space that you have. And so the way we started doing this was to look at it as a 3D environment instead of just trying to grow on the surface of the soil. And to do that, when Chuck and I started out, we came up with our solution was to use um, plastic rain gutter that you use on homes with end caps, you can see that on them, and holes drilled in the bottom and they hang in slings that we just made out of clothesline, <laughs> you know, 15 years later, that's the same clothesline, I mean, and, and the same um, gutters. They really have held up terrifically. And then also then I have raised beds at the bottom and that's where I grow the crops that need more root space than is in those gutters. The gutters are for the salad greens and those are probably the most popular crop that comes out of these greenhouses. So the more of that we can do the better and so some of our greenhouse producers now have looked at different ways to um, try using um, a framework system that you can set the gutters in that allows you to have more of them in the greenhouse because we're just hanging ours off the rafters. And if you have um, a structure that they can be slid in and out of, you can get a lot more of them in there. So there's still a lot of um, testing. I think that people that get into deep winter production by nature, are kind of experimenters, or I call them citizen scientists. So we're always exploring ways to do it better. And, and I don't think that's ever gonna end. And it's actually an exciting part of it. Although we do like to try and, and make it useful, like figuring out which crops grow best and that kind of thing. You can see in the raised bed to the left, that's a uh, purple pak choy, which is exceptionally beautiful in the winter time because winter accentuates the reds in, in the varieties that have it in them. And then to the right uh, at the, in the raised bed, that's um, Chinese cabbage. And towards the south end, the back of the structure, that's um, chard. And this is more Chinese cabbage. At, at this point, it's up in the front. And you can see that another part of this maximizing production is that um, I plant the crops pretty close together. And then as they start to develop and fill in with each other, I harvest every other one for, for each time that I go in to, to fill my CSA. And so then each, so that the first time I do it, they might get two smaller ones. And the next time they might get a medium sized one and then a big one. Um, and it, it just helps make the most out of that space. And then once they're all gone, I refresh the bed and plant some other transplants into it. So it's, it's working hard and you do have to refresh it. I usually, through the winter, just refresh with some compost. I don't necessarily want to add additional fertilizer because these, these plants are in a cool environment. That's sort of the whole point of it is to use as little fossil fuel as possible. So, um, it's not a ferocious summer where they're just like sucking up nutrients. It's milder than that. So you don't, you don't want to um, over fertilize them either. So that's, that's kind of the way that I manage that. 
And the important thing, of course, in a structure where you're letting it get down to 40 degrees, which I do, I think most of us do, um, is that you want to choose crops that like that. And that tends to be the brassicas. So there's a lot of those that we plant, both in leaf form and, and the larger ones down below. Um, so yeah, it turns out there's a whole lot of them. And I thought it might get boring working with those crops, but it hasn't at all because there's also new varieties that are coming up with the seed producers every year. And so what I try to do when I'm experimenting with the new ones is to start by growing them in the middle, middle of winter when the days are the shortest. And that's kind of the, um, that special plant that you're looking for because they're the ones that will get you through those, those middle of the winter most challenging um, times. And so this is an example of the variety that you can get out of there. And my greenhouse looks this way because it, when the CSA is in full bore, there are harvests that happen every week. And so you're going to see some planters have plants that are ready very soon to be harvested, like the bull's blood beets that are on the right there. And also the tatsoi that's, that's on the left. There's um, Mitsuna behind it, and then red Russian kale. Um, and down below, um, you can see that, you know, I used to grow broccoli, but I found that it took up so much room for what you actually harvested off of it, that I switched to broccoli raw because you can eat the whole plant. And that, that's just kind of another choice you have to make, although broccoli is fabulous in there because it's so tender when it grows in there. All of these plants, you know, you expect like some of the mustards that we grow in there are gonna be kind of fierce and hot, peppery flavored, but they're not as much in the winter. They're much milder. And so maybe with Minnesota palates, you know, if you're, if you're having a hard sell on mustard, I really try and encourage them to try them as as leafy, you know, salad greens. It's, it's a very um, different experience and it's quite enjoyable even for people who don't like pepper. This is a, another shot of the um, purple pak choy. It's so gorgeous, you know, that lime green in the veins and that's the color that the bottoms of um, the leaves and the stems are. And then it has that beautiful deep purple color it's actually hard to harvest them because they're so beautiful. <laughs> um, and yeah, I just, they're, they're one of my favorites. They're one of my favorites. Um, so the, the key really for the planting in there is to understand that there's three mini seasons in the, in the deep winter greenhouse. And the first season in the fall is diminishment when each day is getting a little shorter and um, plants respond differently to that as they do in the solstice, the middle season, when you're gonna have your shortest days through a bank of time. And then come in early February, as the days are lengthening, the plants respond to that too. And, and there's two ways to look at that. Um, phototrophism is a plant's response to sunlight. And that's what you see in plants that maybe if you're starting them in the spring and they aren't getting enough sunlight, they start bending toward the light. That's the plant's response to try and get more of that light that's available. And the other one is, oh, where's my notes? Because this one, this is the one that we really paid. Oh yeah, photoperiodism is the plant's response to the day length. And that's going to be different in each of those three mini seasons in the winter. And that's the thing you're looking for because not all plants are the same. Different varieties, even, you know, within the same, you know, even in the brassicas, it, it varies considerably actually because we have some that we've discovered that will grow at the same, you know, rate in the middle of winter as they do on either side of that. Those are the plants you learn to love. And those are the ones you're looking for when you're testing. That's why you start in the middle of winter. Because if they do good for you there, you want to know that. <laughs> because they're, they're really going to bail you out, you know, because it can be, um, that's the trickiest time, but it's not impossible. And the nice part about this aspect of, of the plant's biology and its response to light is that it allows for you to have 
different um, greens mixes all through the winter. So people aren't getting the same bag of greens every single week. It's different every week. And it's not just brassicas that you grow. I mean, I've, I've put in, um, I did try growing red vein sorrel. It's a pretty slow growing crop, but it's quite beautiful. So there are times when I make those choices. It's not just about always just growing the ones that grow the fastest and you know replenish as quickly. Um, but it's also just understanding that people want to see a beautiful salad mix. And, and so like I'll grow um, garden cress, even though that's a little bit slower growing one too, it adds a different flavor. You know, there's, there's so many leafy greens out there and they have different textures and shapes and flavors and rates of growth. And the real key to understanding that and being able to apply it to your planting schedule is, um, well, first of all, you can go and look, I do have a list on our website of, um, the plants that we know do this well in each of those seasons. So you can start with that as kind of a guide. But the really important thing when you're growing is to create your own notebook that you just um, are dedicated to doing every day in the greenhouse. So that you're tracking like every day, what is the weather outside? What's the wind? What's the temperature? Is it cloudy, sunny, something in between? And, and do that kind of monitoring in the greenhouse too. And as you bank up that information, it becomes a very useful guide for you because every greenhouse is, a, is unique. And you're gonna to wanna to know how yours responds to all these things. You can use the information that we've gathered to share with you as a useful tool, but the most useful tool you're gonna have in your greenhouse is your notebook. And I, I really try to stress that because for me, it was absolutely critical at the time when I started 15 years ago, there was really no one to compare this stuff with because we didn't really know of anybody else doing things quite this way. And we needed to find out if what we thought could happen in here could happen. And um, so at the back of my greenhouse, I have uh, some barrels of water just for a, a little added thermal mass. It's not a lot, but it's something and I needed something to put my germination mats on. So that's what you're looking at here is a whole bunch of gutters that um, are, you know, haven't even got their true leaves yet. These are all just cotyledons coming off of these guys. Um, but you can see that's, I usually seed up um, eight of these gutters every week. And that's because it's constantly rotating. And I had um, interns in my greenhouse uh, this year came in and I just let them do whatever they wanted to in there. And they decided to just like seed up the whole thing, blam, right away, which was amazing. I'd never seen the whole greenhouse in full production all at the same time before. And it was crazy because <laughs> it just, it was like this jungle of, of um, salad greens. Um, and they sold it all in one big, you know, cell. And that's what they wanted to do. They learned some things from that. I think they'll probably do it differently. It's in the future, it's just kind of a matter of how much profit you want to make and what are the best markets for you in any given place that you are. Um, but, you know, the other part of this that I, I sometimes forget to mention is that this kind of space is an absolute um, sanity saver in the wintertime in the upper Midwest. Because in this greenhouse, it can be minus 20 outside on a January day. If it's sunny, it's more than 80 degrees in the greenhouse, and you gotta watch that it doesn't get too warm. Because these plants are cool weather crops, and they don't, if they're warm for too long of a time and get stressed, they'll bolt. So it, there is that kind of management going on in there too, but man, oh man, working with those plants in the wintertime. I mean, now we're all just like surrounded. <laughs> <laughs> but this is definitely an oasis in the winter, and it's it's something that um, your customers truly appreciate. And the, on the left side here is a, a mix of salad greens. I normally don't plant mixes because I like to have each variety growing in its own gutter, mostly because they grow at different rates usually, and you don't want a gutter that's got some stuff that just has to get harvested right now and other stuff that's just like a baby and this variety on the left is put out by um, Johnny Seed and it's uh, their wildfire lettuce mix and that is the one I have that they all seem to grow fairly consistently um, be ready for harvest at the same time 
reds. And again, it shows just how red the reds get in the wintertime. And the, the one on the right is that red vein sorrel that I talked about. It's got a nice lemony flavor. And so you don't need a ton of it in a mix either, but it just adds some real beauty. Just like that bull's blood beets that I showed, those deep ruby red things. You've got those in a mix and they really pop and they, they make it look gorgeous. They give it a slightly different flavor when you buy it into them and, and people really like that. This is another red. This one is a red frills. It's a, it's a mustard. Um, you can see how uh, just, you know, all by themselves they're gorgeous, but when they're in a mix with other colors too, they really um, bring, bring all of that out. And it's, uh, it's worth remembering that some of what draws customers or CSA members to this product is the visual. And they, they really do a good job of that. Um, and I think, let's see, this is before I've even planted anything in the beds. This is just, or maybe this is the last of, of that particular year, but I try to put my note, my notes in my notebook into uh, my laptop now because it's, um, it's a little bit easier. But if you're ending up doing it on paper, which I did for many years, um, remember to grab yourself a Ziploc bag and always put that thing in the Ziploc bag when you're not um, using it because this is a damp environment and you can accidentally spray it or drop it in the mud. So um, just remember that that thing is, is um, invaluable to you every year you add your knowledge into it. So now we're gonna get into the soil because that's actually one of my favorite parts of it. I think that really successful farmers tend to be people who love the soil and are, are kind of um, entranced by its complexity and how little we really understand about some of that so that it's another area of, of being a, a farmer or a producer or, or even just a hobbyist that you never get tired of learning how to understand what is going on in that soil, especially when in a greenhouse you're basically making your own. Um, so it was kind of fun when back when my um, late husband and I were writing our book we had a photographer come in and she took this great like sexy picture of, of soil you know components <laughs> and I just looked at it and went oh that's so pretty so at the back of it the dark of course is compost and to the side is peat and out in front of that is vermiculite and we'll get into that stuff but I, have, I, do, I do like to mention, people ask me about being able to use their own compost in the greenhouse. And, you know, everybody's going to do what they want to do. I'm, I'm not like, you know, the, the law when it comes to what you do in your greenhouse. But I just want to share what I know and what I've experienced. And that is, if you're going to use your own compost, you better be one of those crazy compost nuts who is like totally devoted to understanding how you break down the materials in your compost and you make sure that it is completely composted before you bring it into a greenhouse. Because the last thing you want on your greens is anything that is not fully um, composted and especially manure. So I decided because I'm not a compost freak, but, but I certainly do appreciate good compost that I would go with um, bagged, OMRI approved so that it's, it's good for organic production uh, compost. Unfortunately, there's a company in Cold Spring, Minnesota, uh, Mississippi Topsoil, that makes um, that kind of compost. And so I buy theirs. And, and I encouraged our, our local nursery guy to carry it, and he does. So I order it from him, and he delivers it um, to my place every fall. It's a really good idea to get all of your soil needs where you need them in the fall because it can be hard to get some of this stuff if you run out of it in the middle of winter you're probably going to be ordering it online and it isn't going to be cheap so like for my greenhouse which is 18 by 22 i use about mm, 15 to 20 bags of of that compost in a season and I probably go through maybe two of the big bales of peat and a pretty large, you know, like that, the biggest uh, bag that they offer. I don't know how many cubic feet it is, but it's of the vermiculite. 
and you'll want bags of all these different things that that I'm going to go through here. But that's a that's a good thing to remember. Get everything you think you're going to need in the fall, because you don't want to be like trying to chase down uh, a bag of of garden lime in January. <laughs> it's going to be uh, not fun. Okay, let's make it happen. Why isn't it forwarding for me? Come on, wake up! Oh. Hmm. Uh, Greg, are you there? I am. I don't know why your uh, why your presentation won't forward. Can you? Do you have a flywheel on your mouse or? I do, and nothing seems to be. Try um, clicking the 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 button on your cursor or the on your keyboard to you know, move it. Yeah, nothing's happening. How weird is that? Frozen. My mouse is on. It was doing this before. Mm. Um, if I yell at it, does that help? Um, not sure that's going to help, but you can give it a try. Wow. You want to press escape and see if it exits you mm -hmm. from the slideshow mode? Nothing. Oh, dang it. Hmm. Boy, I got nothing. It's never done this before. It's just not letting me do anything. And the, the mouse is on. Maybe if we can unshare. Sure. Yeah, it's not letting me access the top bar. Oh, okay. Here we are. And I still have no mouse. Can you use the trackpad on your computer instead of your mouse? I don't have a trackpad. This is a. Is your mouse plugged in to the yeah. computer? Well, no, my mouse is a um, is a wireless, but. Oh. Uh oh. Yep. And. Oh, I guess my space bar works. Yeah, your mouse is probably out of batteries. But it's it's lit up. It's it's. It is. Yeah, sometimes the light the light's the last thing to go, I think. <laughs> so Okay, so um if you can use the cursor to go back and forth or maybe what hit return, I think. On your slideshow, does that help? I am getting nothing here. It was just working. Yeah, the mouse battery goes out sort of instantly without warning, usually. Okay, well. Let's Do you see. have any other mouse at all, like a plug in one? No, no, not up here. Um, well, let's see. Do what you have it? What are you, you guys seeing now from the screen? We unshared you. Do you have your other? Do you have your other mouse down at your other computer that you could bring up and plug yeah. to this? Yeah. And we could have do Shane's videos in the meantime. Yes. You do that, and I'll be back. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So we're gonna go take a tour of a greenhouse. Yeah, you bet. That sounds great. All right. Um, let me share my screen. Sorry about this, everybody. All right, and can you see my screen? Sure can. Yep. Okay. All right. Let's. See. So. Go ahead, Greg. No, you go. I, I, so uh, yeah, just go. Make sure you let me know uh, if I need to pause or, or fast forward or rewind or anything. Because um, okay, you know, you're in control. You know, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, hi everyone. Um, this is our little corner of the world in central Minnesota, a little town called Pillager. Um, closest big town is Brainerd. Um, we built this structure. This is our second full winter in it. Um, the structure itself is 24 by 24. Um, that's the south facing window or glazing wall. 
Um, it's a polycarbonate material, um, a triple polycarbonate, so it's got a little bit of R value in it. Um, so um, that wall stands about 14 feet at the peak. It's at a 60 degree angle to maximize the, the solar catch in the middle of winter when the sun angle is low. Um, the structure itself is 24 by 24 and Carol mentioned that door in the in the opening slide that um, there's a little eight there's an eight foot by 24 foot vapor lock you could call it I guess we use it for um, um, uh, soil mixing and other things in the back and then the greenhouse space itself is uh, 24 feet wide by 16 feet. Um, so there's our power coming in. Um, this is our back room where we do our soil mixing and everything else with a soil bench. Uh, it gets to be quite tight in there, um, but everything, uh, we keep it fairly organized. So um, things, uh, try to keep it organized anyway. So this is, um, this video was shot about a week ago. So everything's cleared out of the, out of the structure right now because the, the temperature in there right now is probably 105, 106 degrees. So um, it's pretty warm in there. Um, so this is the inside of the growing space with a couple of windows on top to exit the hot air that rises. Um, comes up into those that plenum that's up on top. All the hot air rises in that and then follows that black tube down underground into a four foot rock mass that stores that heat. And then that centrifugal fan sucks that warm air in the middle of winter, sucks that warm air out of the rock mass and distributes it back through that white tube with holes in it. Um, this is our hanging system that we hang our gutters from, much like Carol. Um, we can probably get, what, six gutters high maybe by Five well, gutters high and six across, so about 30 long gutters. And then we've got the whole angled area where we use short gutters on top and they get longer going down. We can get about four in a row on those. Yeah, so, and then we've covered the whole interior space with uh, landscape fabric, keep the weed pressure down or whatever, you know, because there's uh, it's not a lot of weeds, obviously, but there's a lot of water that gets uh, watered on, uh, spilt on the floor and um, all that kind of good stuff. So, um, yeah, that's basically the interior. Um, and I think, Greg, if you want to switch to the the other video, that would well, be you can. wonderful if you can do that, Greg. Okay, I will uh, give it a shot here. I think we're supposed to talk about production instead of what the structure is like. So, like I say, this video was shot. Oh, sorry, Greg. Two weeks ago. This is another video that was shot two weeks ago. So, um, this one shows a lot of our. That we're trying to extend the season of the deep winter greenhouse a little bit into the spring here. So we did all our seed starting in there. Um, and I think I'll let Uzi, if you don't mind, okay. if you want to talk about the plant material that's in Over there. on the left on the racks, back in the shade, is where we had all our shoots growing, pea shoots, sunflower shoots, uh, just because it would not get quite as much direct sunlight, and they seem to do so much better over there by the doorway, especially at this point, it kept it a little bit cooler. You can see the gutters that are hanging up there. And we did just do single gutters, but we would have um, five that were hanging down. We used tables and um, milk or bread crates to raise things up and then um, metal shelving that we used. Also plastic shelving and you can see more gutters that were over there. This was getting to the end point of the season for those, um, we had mustard, and it was very windy that day. If you just saw our egg fab go flying across the yard, um, 
We had arugula, mustard, uh, Chinese cabbage, beets. Uh, oh, couldn't even think of how many more kinds that we had. Endive, different lettuces, gourmet blend lettuces, mm -hmm. and um, just leafy greens, more mustards, and then oak leaf lettuces. Those all went outside a couple of days later, and they're doing wonderful on the north side of the building, just sitting outside in the shade. You, sorry, you can see all the tomatoes. You can also see that cloth that we used. Everything was getting way too warm and there too much sun and I was sunburning tomato plants, um, sunburning eggplants, sunburning some of the other um, starts that we did. So we actually used command um, clips, I believe and put a, an egg fab and hung that over behind the vent and then hung that up about five foot high. And that seemed to eliminate that sunburn problem that we were having on the tables, upper tables. It just kept the limits down a little bit. So the plants were much happier. Well, you can see tomatoes are blossoming inside the greenhouse already. So, um, you know, it's not only used for um, in the middle of winter, which is it's designed for, which is a great, I mean, it functions perfectly in the middle of winter. But we're trying to see how far we can extend it on, you know, either end, the fall end, or now this is the spring end of it. Um, uh, it, it's wor it works great. It's really it's a nice space to start garden starts with um, the Tomatoes love it green peppers love it um, There's a whole host of mater uh, plant material that just really likes it in there. You got a lady that started a lot of flower sets in there and um, Yeah, it's a nice space. Although as Carol said, it's kind of a premium space and it's not huge by any means so um, that's why we were starting to garden a little more vertical than spread out in the field. So next up, Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you back, Carol, or not? I'm back, but my um, computer's not. Oh. This, these are some of the seed starts. We use quite a few different types of trees, um, different things. These were... Uh, Pea, the pea shoots uh, right before they all got their little heads chopped up and then there's sunflowers there's uh, there's some sunflowers that's one thing that has been so beneficial in there is that you just cover the soil we had, we had quite a few kids that came through and they would all every week there'd be someone to help me plant the pea shoots that we'd sow and they'd spread them out and just pack their little hands down over the top. And that was it. Set them on a tray with a brown piece of craft paper. And we got, we got some few young, few young kids involved too, enjoying this, so. Yeah, and I think Carol was mentioning how dense the, the plantings are, um, just because it's premium space. Um, some of those pea shoots are, I don't know, there's a probably a mason's jar full of maybe a pound of pea shoots in there cup. or cup. I mean, pound, that's a lot, cup. a cup of pea shoots. And, um, we just cover them with a craft paper and keep them in the dark until they start to stack them uh, up. start to pop a little bit and then take them out of the stack and turn them loose in the greenhouse and they go crazy. Uh, they love it. And the soil mix we're using, we're us actually using Carol's blend. Um, which works wonderful. Um, she's done a, a fantastic job in figuring out the nitrogen requirements and some other additives to the soil that um, that really make things pop and grow really well. So, um, yeah, I think that's our end of the deal, Greg, unless um, you want us to do more. Well, um, right now, Carol is on the phone with Anna trying to do some troubleshooting, I think. Uh, so <laughs> okay. uh, we can go through some questions if you want. Um, sure. There are a couple for you. Can you talk about what material you have on the floor? 
Um, yeah, uh, the hole, I guess from the bottom of the footing um, up is about a four foot by 24 foot, four foot deep rock mass, like inch and an inch and a half rock, washed rock. So that's the, the storage battery in, you know, underneath the greenhouse. And then above that, we um, put a layer of landscape fabric. Erosion control fabric. Erosion control fabric. Yep. And then we put about four to six inches of just excavated dirt that came out of our hole as a seal kind of over the top of that rock mass. And then we put another layer of landscape fabric, erosion control fabric over the top so that when water is spilt or, you know, overflows and all that kind of good stuff as they're watering plants, it goes through that um, first layer of fabric, soaks into the sand, and then doesn't really necessarily dirty up the rock bed. By that time, it's evaporated. So we try to keep the rock bed as clean as we can because you want voids in the rocks, obviously, to keep the air in there. And then the fan will suck that um, air out and redistribute it back into the greenhouse space. So that's the whole circulation pattern and it works wonderful. It's simple and it's non-mechanical except for the fan and it works wonderful. It really does. Can you talk about that standing fan a little bit what the, about the, you know, the internal ventilation you have? We use a fan right by the door because that back room stays so cool and that's just a box fan. Works great. It just sucks the cool air from the back room in. We have one oscillating fan that stands up higher, about four foot tall. You can see it behind my head right there because we actually moved it in the house for yesterday. And it just oscillates and just keep that one going. And we didn't actually didn't even have to open the windows until yesterday to exhaust more of that heat, but almost all the plants were out of there by then. So we, it's been a wonderful spring. We've used the two fans and the, re, the one in the system, that's been it. And even in the dead of the winter, um, we like to keep a little air circulation. We have that eight inch centrifugal fan on constantly. It wouldn't yeah. have to be on, but we keep it on constantly. Yeah. That sucks air out of the rock mass and redistributes it. And I, I don't know, it just, we like to have a little wind movement just to keep things, it sturdies up the plants for one thing, you know, especially in the spring here, it sturdies them up. And then uh, there's just a lot of condensation in there that we just like to keep moving. All right, um, Carol, if you're uh, good to go, I think we'll cut back to you. Um, you can I understand you're gonna finish up without the uh, PowerPoint. Sorry, everybody, but oh, um, we'll do that and then we'll get back to questions when Carol's done. Don't forget to unmute Carol. Oh. Okay, Carol's having trouble unmuting. Let's see if I can unmute you. I don't have the ability to unmute her either. Anna, can you do that? Okay, hang on, I'm trying here. There, oh, no. So we really, when we said bear with us <laughs> with the technology, <laughs> sorry, everybody. not letting me unmute her. Hmm. Dan, any suggestions why it wouldn't be let unmute her? Um, and I guess in the meantime, we can ask more questions of Shane and Louise. Maybe you guys can uh, field these and perhaps I, if you can't, I might be able to answer some or Dan. Um, yeah. do you wanna, 
Let's see, if you talk about starting plants for the summer in the greenhouse, do you use light or heat mats? I have a real small heat mat that I use. Um, it fits one flat, basically. I start all my plants, probably 12 baskets in a regular 10, 20 flat. So I can have 12 different things started at once. I also use milk jugs to start things. Um, the freezer that you saw when you walked in the back door on the video, it's an upright freezer that doesn't work anymore and that is my germination chamber. Um, it stays dark, I do not have a light in there, but I'm checking it three times a day and I run it with a crock pot of water down on the bottom and that puts enough humidity and heat in there that I can usually get things to germinate within two or three days. Um, we didn't start using that until mid-spring when that back room had warmed up a little bit. So I didn't really need to put in a light or anything. I would just move the plants as soon as they were sprouted and then move them to a rack in the greenhouse. So no, I don't really use other than that one germination mat. That's what we use. All right, another question here. Can you talk about starting plants for summer in the greenhouse? Do you use, oh, that's the one you just answered. How about um, uh, when month and day do you start your seeds and do you grow the beets for the greens or the root? And I'll just note, I, can, I think I could speak for Carol here that Carol uses the gutters and grows beets, some types of beets, the bulls, but beets for their greens and seeds them really densely in the gutters, but it, maybe you have a different uh, thing that you do or, and maybe you can talk a little bit about when month and day you start your seeds? Um, on the beets, I use Early Wonder Tall Top. It's an old beet known for its beet greens. They're wonderful. I've tried um, after harvesting the beet greens a couple of times, just letting a few of them grow, thinning them out a little bit to see if I could get a beet to grow and have not been successful with getting a root to grow out of the gutter. Also tried that with radish too, where we take the radish tops um, let a few of them grow out, see if we could get it to bulb, have not had success with that. Starting the seeds, um, my leeks, my onions, a globe artichoke, uh, some of the eggplants, we're starting the third week in January. Also, we start um, sweet potato tubers, a few other of the tuber flowers that we start then. They'll get potted in Carol's mixed dirt and just set on the floor in a back corner where they're not obstructing any light or any view from the other things. Um, other than that, um, for the gutters, we're continually switching out gutters. And as soon as they're harvested three to four times, we'll dump, use that for a compost in an outside bed later on and start something new. We'll fill it with a new mix of Carol's recipe and Try something different, see what goes on. Great. Um, can you tell us about whether or not you have to special order that polycarbonate in that length? Uh, yeah, we got it from Menards actually. Um, but yeah, it is a special order item. I think it's, uh, I think those are 14 foot sheets, four feet wide, 14 feet long. Yeah, and it is a special order item. They're kind of expensive, but um, it's a good place to invest your money, obviously. That's probably the most important wall in the entire greenhouse. So um, a little extra expense there uh, goes a long ways. I wouldn't use anything other than a triple polycarbonate. A single just isn't going to hold up. So, And I'm all pretty close, and I've ricocheted a few rocks off it and uh, haven't damaged it. Thus you see the large area of hay and straw in front of there now. No more mowing, no, stay away. <laughs> All right. So would it be uh, possible to continue some production into the summer if there were more mechanical ventilation built into the design like walls that open or retractable sections or would it always be too hot in the summer? And I'll just note here also, I don't know if we've mentioned it yet, but um, you might all, if you registered, be aware. But tomorrow we're hosting 
a uh, webinar specifically oriented towards our deep winter greenhouse design and the new farm scale greenhouse design, as well as I think a little overview of how this design works. Uh, so we can go over some quick uh, answers for some of these design questions, but a lot of that will be dealt with in more detail tomorrow. And I believe on the fifth as well, later in the week, will be uh, the same webinar repeated if you'd wanna join once or twice or have uh, availability one day, but not the other. So, um, but if you have a quick answer to that, maybe you can give that. Otherwise, we'll deal with that in a later time. We had um, last summer, and this is weather dependent, thanks to Mother Nature, we had a cool, damp spring. We didn't get a lot of our stuff in the ground outside. It was too cold. You couldn't kneel on the ground. We had plants growing in the greenhouse until the third week in July last year. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. We'd open up the two windows. We didn't even have to set a fan in the upper windows. And just kept the two, yes, two fans going pretty much like we had, like you saw them in the video. And we had plants in there until July. It was yeah. just a different year. Now this year we're cleaned out already. We had to move pretty much everything out last week. So, mother yeah, nature my, rules. In my experience too, I think it depends on where, it might depend on where you are. In uh, Northern Minnesota, I've been in some greenhouses in June, July and had it be just a couple degrees hotter than it was outside with shade cloth, but in Southern Minnesota, perhaps it's a little more um, of, a, of an oven inside. Okay. Uh, how much did this cost to build? Um, we hired everything for it, except the electricity and the interior work. Um, it's probably, we probably got about oh, 35000 to $40,000 into it. Um, but that's no, that's none of my labor or none of our labor at all. So you could probably reduce that cost by another five $6,000 pretty easily. So I read around thirty to $40,000. And I think that's what, um, I think that's kind of what started the, the conversation it's a little expensive you know for the average joe around town but um so i think that's what um version three is going to try to you know start to start to address is that that initial cost and other design features obviously too but um but it it's uh it's worth its money we haven't uh got our entire return on investment all <laughs> done yet, obviously, but um, yeah, we're hoping we can turn turn that around in about seven to eight to 10 years, right around in there, hopefully. I think less than that. Hopefully less than that. Yeah. Yep. So our, our prototype designs, the five that we built ranged from $22,000, I believe, where labor was not um, a cost, where there was volunteer or personal labor put in. If you don't, if you manage to not account for that, um, about $20,000, $22,000 was the cheapest. The ones, I think that median was about yours, about $40,000 given uh, maybe a one or $2,000 up or down, uh, where people did uh, spend all uh, spend out all of the labor and then there was one that was extremely expensive was sixty eight thousand dollars all five designs were these roughly ex the same so um, it is possible I think uh, a, a remote location might bring extra costs for labor and for materials uh, and some materials so um, uh, it, it can vary for uh, each person depending on where you are but I think forty thousand dollars is about a good estimate for uh, this particular greenhouse. Yep. Um, flooring follow-up question. What is on top? What is on top of the top layer of erosion control fabric? Uh, nothing. <laughs> Plant material. Well, that's the top of our floor. There's a, there's a rock mass, four foot rock, deep rock mass, layer of erosion control fabric, four to six inches roughly of the excavated dirt that came out of our hole. Which is sand. Which is sand. So that kind of is a ceiling layer that we try to call it. Um, and then another layer of landscape fabric. Um, the one in Bemidji, I believe, has a concrete floor. And I think uh, the one in Finland, didn't that one have a wooden floor, Greg? I think yep. they may have taken that out, but I'm not sure. 
Well, I think they had your floor, but then put wooden slats on top of it. Oh, okay. okay. All righty. Yeah. So I think, you know, the, what that sand layer does is the, it tries to, or it's supposed to seal that rock mass. So that hot air that's in the rock mass just doesn't come inadvertent, but it does, but it, so it limits the amount of hot air coming up through the floor. We want to keep it down in that storage battery so we can distribute it through the fan and um, the plenums. So. Great. All right. Uh, would you recommend a deep water greenhouse for personal use or only if you're doing large production like a CSA? We don't do large production CSA. We, feed, we do two um, organic food co-ops and then people just stop in, hey, see what we have uh, and things like that. Personal use would be wonderful. I mean, if nothing else, it, especially in times like this, it's just a wonderful place to go. It's a feel good place besides, so. Yeah, we know, a, bonus. We know a guy um, that's probably 25 miles north of us in, uh, in between Pequot and Pine River. Um, he just built one all by himself. I mean, he dug the hole with a shovel, which Pretty is much. really a crazy thing to do, but anyway, um, I don't know how much money he's got into it, but that's just a personal use space. Yep. And he came over and took a bunch of measurements of ours and uh, just started pounding nails. Because that's another beautiful thing about this design is, you know, you can you can source all the materials locally um, with a little bit of construction knowledge. You can pound the nails and screw this thing together, you know, in uh, several weekends. Um, that's a really you know, kudos to Dan Hedin for making it uh, a local thing that you and I could build. Yep, and I, I also mentioned, I'll mention that before we built this 2.0 design, this is based off of, a, a, you know, the same, a similar uh, design concepts that that half a dozen people at that point had already put together. So like Carol's Greenhouse is is not our design, but it was built off the south side of a garage. People build these off the south side of a of barns, garages, you know, milking sheds, all sorts of things. So there are um, any number of ways to, to put these together beyond what we've done. So a lot of people building sort of DIY greenhouses do it much cheaper with uh, re recycled materials or, you know, whatever stones they might have on the ground or with soil as a, as a thermal mass. So there's lots of ways to do it. And um, if you can, you know, if you can do it for a cost that's that's comfortable for you, then a personal use would be a great a great way to do it. But you know, yeah. Yeah. it's a it's a matter of what you what your resources are and what you can put together. I think. Yeah. So um, another question here: What's the name of the company in Cold Spring for soil? It's Mississippi Topsoil. Uh, um, they they have a number of bagged products: soil, potting mix, uh, um, compost. Uh, there is another one that people in Minnesota use, um, blue or purple cow, purple cow topsoil and compost. It's out of, I think, the Eau Claire area of Wisconsin, maybe La Crosse, somewhere in Wisconsin. But um, I think some are available to some, uh, or purple cow might be available to some, Mississippi topsoil to others. But, and then we see Carol is back here. Carol, are you, uh, are you with us? She's still muted. You're still, you're still muted, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're unmuted. There. Hi, Carol. <laughs> wow. Devil, thy name is technology. <laughs> um, I don't know if you're able to put your uh, your your presentation back up, but if you are, um, it's not on my laptop anymore. So okay. No, but I can talk. Yeah, maybe we'll just turn it back over to you. And then uh, when you're done, we'll try to get through the rest of these questions. Okay, hang on. Let me get my, um, talk to me again. I want to get my volume level right. Okay. Hey, Carol, are you ready? Can you yes. Do it? Hear me? Yes. Is it loud? All right. Well, back <gasps> to you. Like hell. I've been running all over the place. <laughs> Three computers later, I'm back. Wouldn't it be the trusty laptop that ends up being the one? Okay, am I on live with everybody? Okay. 
Um, so I left off talking about soil amendments and you did get to see some of those components. Um, I'm going to explain it by just running through the recipe for the soil uh, that I make. Um, you can buy your own pre-mixed soil, but um, I found that I really like to be able to control the components in it. That's just me. Not everybody's that crazy. Uh, but I do like the results from it very much. We did do some uh, trials on different soil mixes and um, mine proved to pretty much by a, by a couple of hairs uh, better. Um, we compared it to another soil mix where they used uh, cow manure compost. Mine is a, is a combination of forest waste and turkey manure. And so that one does very well too. I think for me, really the bottom line as far as that whole compost debate goes is that if you are not kind of an expert at making sure that your compost is, is very well composted, um, it can be a dangerous bargaining game um, using that in a soil mix for raising greens. Because if there is any E. coli in there, any um, unbroken down manure, and you end up having people have health problems as a result of your product, you're going to be in a world of hurt. And the problem, of course, with that too, is that it can end up giving the rest of us a bad name as well as happens when that sort of outbreak takes place. It normally takes place on very large scale, but um, it's, it's the same kind of reason. If, if there's uncomposted manure, that gets onto the plants, you, you risk um, making your customers very unhealthy. And that's just, that's not gonna go well. And to me, it was more important to have a, uh, because it's Omri improved, the product that I buy, I know that I have some backup there as far as what my expectations can be on the quality of that compost. So that is what I do, that is what I recommend. Um, just be careful if you try and do it in a different way. The other possibility with um, bringing in your own compost is that there could be soil pathogens or nasty critters that are in your compost that you don't recognize or see. And if you bring that into your greenhouse, there's no natural um, balances at, at play in the greenhouse like there are outdoors. So just, just bear that in mind. And um, so the way it goes, is the the mix starts off if, if you can imagine like a a one gallon ice cream bucket that's kind of what i use as my my measuring cup um you're going to be doing three gallons of peat and you can put it into a tote you can put it into a wheelbarrow however you want to mix it up i um have a nice um garden tool that's a it's, it's a fairly large thing and it has a, a spade on one side of it and on the other side it's a fork for the the and the handle is good and steady and big i've also used a hoe a hoe works too um a hoe works good if you're doing a tote because you want to make sure and eventually you probably get your hands in there to make sure that everything gets well incorporated together. So that first batch that you're incorporating is that three gallons of peat and a half a cup of garden lime. The lime helps balance the pH of the peat. So you work those together really well. Then you're gonna be adding in two of those um, buckets of vermiculite. You could also use perlite. I prefer vermiculite because it's less, um, uh, it doesn't produce as much dust. And also both of them are heat expanded minerals, rock, that in the case of the perlite, it really doesn't have any nutrients in it at all. And it resists water. The vermiculite will actually retain water and it has some micronutrients in it. That plus the fact that it's not as dusty is the winning thing for me. So that is what I choose you can do either one. The perlite is that white stuff that gets kind of green and weird looking if it's, it's been in soil for a while. So that's also an unattractive element of us that I don't like. So there you go. Um, so you've got those two uh, buckets of the vermiculite. And with that, you're going to be bringing in the, the three um, uh, rock fertilizers that I use or the, the mineral fertilizer, sorry. So the first of that is blood meal, and I'll come back to that. 
The second one is green sand, and the third one is rock phosphate. And with the blood meal, what we've discovered in the winter, because our plants are slower growing, that you don't necessarily need as much nitrogen as, as we thought with the mix from the past. So what I've decided to do is I put in half that amount. So with each of these uh, mineral component, components, you're putting in one cup. For this for this recipe, you can mix them in the in so you can mix them ahead of time if you want to. But because I vary the nitrogen, I tend to um, just mix enough for the batches that I'm doing that day. And so so it's one cup of the rock phosphate and one cup of the green sand and half a cup of the nitrogen in the first third of our winter growing season. In the middle of the growing season, I cut the nitrogen out completely. They're just growing slowly enough that you don't want them getting an excess of nitrogen that they don't need. And in the third, when everything's starting to kind of get excited about the longer days and all that, you can go ahead um, when, when things are really just growing like nuts, really pretty much like by the beginning of March, you can put in a full cup of nitrogen and it's going to be just fine. So you mix those things in with the vermiculite into the, the peat and lime that you have. Everybody gets all mixed together at that point. And the last thing that goes in is three of those um, gallon containers of your compost. And once that's mixed in, you're good to go. And you can make that stuff ahead of time. I've done that, um, especially if I've had people coming in and wanting to learn how to do stuff in the greenhouse. We'll mix a whole bunch of soil at the same time and put it into totes. And you can put the lids on so you can stack them. But it's important to realize that it does get warm in the greenhouse. And if those totes are going to be sitting there for a while, what I try to do is open them up and let them breathe like once a week. If I'm in there on the weekend working, I'll burp the, the boxes you know, so that they've got some fresh air. Otherwise, if they get warm enough and they're moist enough, long enough, um, they might get a little bit of like a like a fuzzy mold on top of it. It's not all that dangerous. I mean, I can just, you know, brush it away and it's gone, but eh, you know, all you got to do is give them a little extra air and, and you'll avoid that. Um, and that's pretty much it. That is the mix that I use to put into the um, hanging gutters. Uh, I use various parts of those components um, when I'm introducing reintroducing the good stuff in the greenhouse in the, in this in the fall um it's a good idea to especially if you're just getting used to doing this to do a soil test in your greenhouse every fall the thing you don't want to be doing is is giving yourself extra costs that you don't need to by putting more in there that you need to i have a feel for it over the years about how much i need to introduce um, and it depends on what's been grown in those raised beds. If they've had some really heavy eating, you know, feeding kinds of um, plants in them, they're going to get some extra attention. I'll probably reintroduce some um, mineral fertilizer to that. But usually all it needs is if it's looking like it's broken down quite a bit over the years, then I'll introduce in some more peat again just to make sure that that, that soil is well aerated. Um, but I always put in more compost in the fall. And that's Again, it depends on what you get back um, from your soil test, so let that be your guide. But yeah, in the, in the middle of the season, if I feel like a bed needs to be refreshed a little bit, it probably just needs a little more compost. Uh, so that's generally what I will apply. Like once everything has been harvested out of a bed, I'll introduce uh, maybe a bag or a half a bag of compost into that bed and work it in again and, and that will carry it through the rest of the season really. Um, can, you, um, can you use coconut coir instead of peat moss? You can. I have used that and, and it's nice to always be looking for sustainable products um, and I would like to find something like that but again you're, you're kind of weighing that thing. We can get our peat moss from Canada which is a little bit closer than wherever those coconuts are coming from, probably. And then there's the that whole thing. Well, they're they're both manufactured, though. I was going to say, like, what they have to do an awful lot to um, coconut hulls to make them into a, a plant product. And and I have found that 
it, it doesn't have quite the same properties as the peat, but I get, I get that peat is a finite thing. It takes a long, long time to regenerate it. Um, we did test, well, these, this is kind of far out on the, in the weedy edges here, but we did do um, some research on using plant material that was harvested from local ponds. There were three different kinds of pond weeds that that particular um, student researcher harvested and dried and then um, tested in my greenhouse to see which would work better. And I thought that the results from that were pretty interesting, but it was a, it was a high school student's um, state science project. She did, she did get a, a what was she like second in state or something for that one. Um, so there, there are ways that people can look to solve that problem about peat and some of the environmental concerns there are there with that. I started with it because when my late husband and I were first getting going, the, the answers that populated questions that we had about choices, whether it was building material or soil amendments, um, was not only to find a solution for ourselves, but one for people who might wanna be getting into this that would be the most accessible and affordable for them. And so that's why, that was why initially I went with peat because it was something I knew anybody could get and it wouldn't be that hard to find. Um, but it probably, I mean, if, if that's the reason you asked that question, is that really the sustainable answer? Probably not. And so that's one of the things that we'll need to keep looking for other ways to address that, that are mindful of sustainability. Good question, Greg. <laughs> well, it wasn't my question. <laughs> oh, <laughs> here I am thinking you're all smart and stuff. Okay. No, no, no. Um, um, would you like so, to go through yeah. questions, Carol, or do you have do you have more? Yeah, let's go, let's go to questions. Okay. So um, there's about let's see, there's 11 questions here. Some of them um, may have been addressed already, but I'll just kind of go from the top down. Okay. Um, and then they're for both, both of y'all, you and Shane and, and Louise. So um, Shane, how much heating fuel did you use over winter? Absolutely zero. No fuel. No fuel at all. It's uh, no fossil fuels anyway. We use a little electricity if that's a fuel. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's a little, um, Oh, I can't remember the exact, I think it's like a 5,000 BTU little heater you might have saw up in the corner of the video. Um, I never heard it kick on the entire winter, um, but I'm not standing out there at 2 o'clock in the morning when it's really frigid out. But last winter it was 38 to 48 degrees below zero often, below. and I never heard it kick on. So... That just goes to tell you how well insulated it is. And the insulation is a rock wool, not just a normal fiberglass. So it's a lot denser material. Two by six stud walls, two by 10 roof. Um, uh, yeah, you know what I mean. Roof rafters. Um, and that's all stuff full of rock wool insulation. So the envelope is really tight and uh, it holds its heat really well. So zero fossil fuels were burnt last winter, yay. Our electric bill over the past two winters has gone up in between eight and $10 a month from running the fan, the two fan systems. And we have a day tank and a- Pressure tank. Pressure tank, there we go, in there. And that's it, it's been on the average $8 a month to run it. And we run the fan underground constant. It just keeps circulating that hot air down into that rock mass. So eight dollars is pretty pretty good. Now, I, I want to say though that these these backup heaters do kick on. <laughs> this isn't this isn't a zero oh, yeah. system. Yeah. So you, just to be clear with people, because some people I don't think understand that this isn't a zero energy system. No. Uh, the, especially in those cold nights, and especially on cloudy days where there's several cloudy days in a row, that fan will kick on or that heater will kick on and. You know, it might not run continuously, but it'll get you up to that 40 degrees or, you know, keep you above that 40 degrees so that um, you can wait. Right. Till that. We yeah. have it thermostatically set to kick on at, I don't know, 38 degrees or 40 degrees, somewhere right around in there. 
Um, but the guy that I was talking about up between Pequot and Pine River, he uh, he has a wood stove, an exterior, an outside wood stove that he piped underground and then came up into his greenhouse. So he heats it with um, with wood instead of that electric fan. So yeah, and I think that's that's an important um, factor in all of this is. You really do need, when you're working with a passive solar design, you need some redundant systems because you just never know what's going to fail on you. As, as I just suddenly experienced with my computer, um, it's good to have backup. Thank you, little laptop. Um, and there's lots of ways you can explore that. You can, we do know like one grower who is um, off grid with, with his deep winter greenhouse and he's got several systems for, for heating to do that. And one of the ones I've talked to some people about that I'm actually really interested in myself is rocket stoves. I know there's, and there's going to be pluses and minuses to, to any one of these that you consider. Um, if you're going for one that's a little less traditional, like being able to, to plug in an electric heater, I would say go with at least three. You know, go with the passive solar, uh, maybe a backup heater and... Uh, maybe try out uh, that kind of system that you described or a rocket stove or something. Uh, maybe um, charging up a, a battery to run that heater with an active solar, you know, system. There's, there's lots of ways you can do it. Wind, you know, you could power up a battery using wind. So it's, it's really just whatever kind of that, that a person can follow their passion on as far as those things go. But the bottom line is that it certainly gives you some flexibility and it, and it's so, so much less um, uh, standard dinosaur fuel than any other system that I've ever seen. So I think we're, we're on the right track for being able to actually be a viable part of a resilient local food system because we can keep tweaking these ways that we're less and less dependent on uh, those more traditional sources of fuel that are finite. Yeah, and we have no, we don't use, utilize any grow lights or any traditional right. things that you might find in a green, you know, a, a commercial greenhouse. Um, in the middle of winter, the sun angle is low, but I think the design really lends itself to be able to capture that. So we don't need any additional, I mean, you know, there there's periods throughout the winter that you may not get sunlight for quite a while, but then the plants just kind of go into a hybrid Hiber, hibernation kind of deal and uh, um, pop back up when the sun comes out. Well, it's like Dan Handeen always says, you know, you can, you can grow anything in the winter if you throw enough energy at it. Right. But who wants to pay a hundred dollars for a banana? Yeah. yeah. Right. So that's why we went with the cool weather crops. And it turns out um, people really crave those fresh greens in the winter time. It's one of those things that, you you recognize the quality. Uh, I think our greens certainly outlast a lot of the ones that I've ever bought in a store. But then also, you know, I'm, I'm out in an area in West Central Minnesota that's considered a food desert. And so uh, the length of time that it takes for food to get here is reflected in the amount of time it's edible <laughs> once it gets here and the quality of it once it gets here. So that's the thing to me that that's so gratifying is that we can really give people in our own sort of food circle the best possible vegetables they can have in the wintertime. And that's saying a lot when you're out here on the, you know, Western Prairie where like you said, it can get minus 43 and still we're eating fresh salads out of our greenhouses. That's pretty so, great. There's a question here that I don't think you mentioned in the, in, in your talk, uh, maybe your, <laughs> your next slide, but um, you talk about some of the pest problems and how they're dealt with in the greenhouse. Imagine that bugs are for the most part a non-issue, but you know, you can talk about how they are and aren't an issue and what you do with them. It can be an issue. Um, the thing that I, I try to say to everybody I ever talk to about greenhouses and um, they either listen or they don't is that the best thing you can do to prevent bugs from coming in is to not bring them in. And the easiest way to bring them in is by bringing in plants from outside. So don't. <laughs> Just 
Resist the temptation to bring in that favorite geranium or that rosemary plant that you want to overwinter. Don't do it because that is, that is almost always the way somebody calling me in a panic realizes is how they brought bugs into their greenhouse. Now the first infestation that I ever got wasn't that it was that it was the first year um, that I was growing and I had been told by the special bug guy that, um, Nobody ever gets uh, infestation their first year. It's kind of a freebie. Um, but he didn't realize that I was living in a, a village with, um, you know, traditional agriculture all around me, including soybeans, which often have a lot of aphids on them and are sprayed pretty hard to prevent that. But it's pretty hard to kill all of them. So um, in the fall, they're looking for a place to be. And they probably smelled my greenhouse and thought they'd, hit heaven and by the time I realized they were in there because I wasn't observing for them I had quite an infestation on my hands I tried treating it with different sprays um, and stuff like that and the problem is with the organic sprays in a deep winter greenhouse you're fumigating yourself while you're fumigating the bugs and, and even if it is an organic product it's it's still a killer you know so it's not great to be breathing that at that level and also to kill the bug the spray has to hit the bug and in an intensive environment like you saw in the pictures of these greenhouses it's it's virtually impossible to kill them all and with aphids they're clones so they come out a mom ready to be a mom and they can develop their numbers remarkably quickly and if they start feeling uh, population pressure, some of them sprout wings so they can get to someplace else. So you're really in a bind if, if they've got a toehold. But the good news is that there are beneficial insects and there are insectiaries whose sole purpose in life is to breed those bugs for you. And so when I had my first one and I was in an absolute panic and I called uh, the company that I use, Green Methods, um, they talked me through it because by this point it was midwinter and a lot, some of the beneficial insects are kind of dormant in that period. Um, so they suggested I try ladybugs and then they also suggested these parasitic wasps. And what you find out from them very quickly, fortunately they have a very informative website because you need to know exactly what kind of aphid that you have so you can introduce the correct um, bug that's gonna take care of them for you. And in my case, this parasitic wasp, in the two weeks those females are in their adult cycle of their life, it is devoted entirely to finding aphids and using their ovipositor to put one egg in each aphid for as long as they can until they die. And then the egg that's in that aphid ends up pupating within that aphid. The aphid of course dies from this and when the wasp is ready to emerge, she cuts a little hole in the back of the abdomen of the aphid and pops her little trap door and crawls out and starts the whole thing over again. And these wasps are no bigger than an aphid themselves. So you, not only are you starting to understand sort of the life cycle and the purpose and how this insect works to your advantage, um, but also how to make sure that they're, you know, you're giving them what they need so that they can succeed at that. And it's, it's kind of, fortunately, I'm sort of interested in insects anyway. So I found all of this very informative and interesting, but it certainly behooves you as a gardener or a farmer to understand the life cycle of the pest you want to get rid of and the insects that will help you do that. And they have a, a site, and there's many other sites like this too. You just need to get educated about it. Can you tell us about that, that, that website. Yeah. What's what's the website? Green Methods. Is Green the Methods dot, is the company, so it's like yeah. either Green just Methods Google on them and you'll get Google. them. And yeah. they're they were super helpful to me on the phone. Um, it's not a cheap fix, which is why I I always start by recommending just don't bring them in in the first place, because half of the price of getting the bugs is having them shipped to you live because different uh, beneficial insects come to you at different points in, in their life cycle. Some might come as eggs, others are already you know pupating and you, you put them in your greenhouse and they, they crawl out and begin the thing. But in the case of these particular wasps, they come to you as adult females and you release them 
into your greenhouse and you need to know how to do that correctly too. So it's, it's, it's not rocket science, but um, if you're going to spend $200 fixing the problem and that might sound like a lot of money and, and until you've spent, you know, like the last four weekends crawling around on your hands and knees with a spray bottle and a mask over your face, trying to hit bugs on the underside of your plants. And you can't, you know, keep redoing that is the other thing, like with the soap sprays that I would use, it would knock them back for a while, but then the aphids would come again and you can't just keep spraying your leafy salad greens with soap over and over again. For one thing, if you end up having a really sunny day, that soap can actually burn the leaves of the plants. So for me, using the insects was definitely the way to go and wising up about how to minimize the chances of having another outbreak like that. I think in the 15 years that I've been growing, that I have had aphids three times, maybe four. So, so the one I'm going to cut in here now and say it's 3.30. The uh, webinar is, this was the time we said we would be finished up. We are going to stick around for another half an hour to answer, try to answer all of the questions. If anybody would like to jump off now or any at any point, please do jump off the webinar if you're, if you're done. If you would like to stay on, we're going to try to get as many questions as we can answered here. Should we move on to something besides bugs? <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, we just heard earlier that Chad and Louise uh, have about their uh, their success or lack there of growing root crops. Have you ever grown anything to harvest as roots in your raised beds, or do you know of anyone growing tomatoes or peppers to fruit? Um, I uh, I don't very often grow root crops in my greenhouse, and here's why. They grow really great outside in the summertime, and they store really well in a good storage system in the winter. So why would I waste space in my, that precious growing space in my greenhouse, growing stuff that I could have been growing in the summer and just store them and have them readily available when I'm doing my CSA? But I have in the spring grown... Um, Icicle radishes and um, halkery turnips. I hope I pronounced that right. It's those little baby white salad um, turnips. And the leaves are edible as well as, as the root. And they, they only get, you know, like golf ball size-ish size at best. Um, those are nice to have in the spring just to give everybody something a little bit different. Um, but other than that, when I was doing my full blown, full blown deep winter greenhouse CSA. Um, I was growing all of my root crops and the storage vegetables like the potatoes and the onions and um, squashes and stuff like that outside. And so to keep that interesting, I learned how to grow a whole bunch of really crazy different, you don't see that very often out here, root crops. And that was kind of fun. Uh, but what I found when I was doing um, my uh, end of the year, end of the season surveys with my um, CSA members. And I would ask them about different things and what they liked. And they were all kind of meh, you know, about the, the root crops. They were really in it for the fresh stuff. And I thought, why am I busting my hump growing all this stuff if nobody really cares? And it was the same thing. Like I did one, a, one or two years I grew things that I could freeze and, and then do like those, those vacuum packed sort of sealer things. And with that, I did um, tomatoes and peppers and green beans. And I also at some point um, early on was trying different herbs and stuff. Nobody really cared about that so much. They, they didn't care about the frozen stuff so much either. They really wanted those fresh greens. And I thought, well, okay. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm going to put my, you know, energy into because that's what they want. But that that's something that I talk to people about a lot when they're getting started and thinking about doing this is to sort of take a look around and do some idea generating with, with friends and mentors about what you perceive the markets to be where you are, because it's going to be different in a city than it's going to be out here in the middle of nowhere or in the middle of everything as some folks out here like to say. But um, so I know like for instance, Brooke Nicely has had good return on being able to grow microgreens because there's a, um, 
there's a food co-op that wants them. And so they've obvious, obviously got members that want to buy that. I know that around where I live, that would never fly because they'd be like, how much do I have to spend for this little bitty bag of greens when I could have a big bag of salad greens from Carol? And that's, that's what they prefer. And they like to have my salad greens sort of fork ready. You know, they don't want to have to do a lot of messing around with them and tearing them up and, oh, you know, you can break a sweat doing that. <laughs> but they just want to be able to throw it in a bowl, grab a fork and have a meal. And so that's the size that I grow mine to harvest. So it's anywhere from three to maybe five inches max, you know, for height on them. And that's what my market wants. And I don't mind growing that. So it's kind of got to be that balance. There might be a huge market for somebody somewhere to be growing pea shoots. And why wouldn't there be? Because I don't know anybody that doesn't like them once they try them. And, yeah. but, you know, so it's, it's that sort of thing. I mean, it has to be, um, I think satisfying for the grower, obviously, but also you've got to be able to have people that want it. And so in, in some cases, somebody might decide that they want to serve a gourmet restaurant market. I wouldn't put all of my eggs in, in one restaurant, as it were. Um, you definitely want to spread out uh, the number of them that you have just because uh, restaurants go out of business all the time. And I've, I've seen people get burnt by that. Um, so there's, there's all of those questions that are worth mulling over while somebody's also like picking their site, deciding the size, how are we going to pay for it? All of those things that go into these many steps towards finally having that greenhouse that you want. Yeah, we probably sold, I don't know what, 15 flats of peas, pea shoots this Oh, more than oh, that. More than that, probably. Yeah, you just can't grow enough of them, can you? No, you no. can't grow enough pea shoots or sunflower shoots um, yeah. around here anyway. Yeah. It's been wonderful. And then the small greens, like you said, you grow them a little bit bigger. We don't grow, we don't do the microgreens so much, but yet you get to that three to five inch leaf stage and you can still harvest them three, four, maybe even five times and then put them outside. And they're still going like gangbusters. They're just yeah. doing wonderful. So I've seen that too. That's I do that for myself. I take them. I take when I'm taking the last of the gutters out of the greenhouse. I just set them in this sort of semi shady spot yep. right outside the greenhouse, and then I I eat off them if the rabbits don't find them. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so there's some more questions here. I'm wondering, uh, there's a follow-up question back to the, the uh, wasps. Do, can you talk about whether the wasps have a negative effect on beehives? Oh, gosh. These little girls are, I mean, imagine how small an aphid is. They're that small. You have to, like, get out your magnifying glass and take a good look at them so that you can learn to identify the difference between these adult female wasps and an aphid that has sprouted rings, wings because they turn a little bit black in color when they do that. The wings are black. So no, these wasps aren't hurting anybody. They, they certainly couldn't sting you and they couldn't sting another insect if they wanted to, except because what they're using on these aphids is not a stinger, it's an ovipositor. They're using their ovipositor to insert into an aphid and then deposit an egg into it. So they're, they're, they're only alive for two weeks and all they want to do is this particular activity. They're not aggressive in any way. And they certainly, I mean, they wouldn't even be lunch for a honeybee. So there's a couple of questions here that are, are related about time. Um, how much time on average do you spend harvesting? And then another one oh. up here about... Um, da, 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 da. It's about how much... Uh, can't find it right now, but how much time does it take? How much time do you spend in your greenhouse on average? Should I let uh, Shane and Louise take that first and then I'll do it? Right. Why don't you guys say your bit on that first? Well, with, with seeding the shoots and with the harvesting, um, pretty much four hours a week. After the initial gutter seeding, which I do... Um, well, probably once every three weeks we add gutters. They take a little bit longer to seed, but after that, just the harvesting and taking care of the pea shoots, sunflower shoots, and whatnot, 
about four hours a week. And that's washing what I have to wash and cleaning if I any cleaning. And that's weighing and packaging and getting it into the little mini fridge that we have out there. What about like then the reseeding kind of work that you do each week? Each week uh, to reseed them maybe takes, oh, five minutes. <laughs> On the shoots and it's the It's got to take a little I, more than that. I mean, you're because you're mixing soil and, you know. Nope, so. my soil is all ready to go, so I didn't count that in. My soil is ready to go. I've got that pretty much ready for how much I need. And just go fill up the flat and dump mm -hmm. the peas in there, pat them down and cover them, and then just keep going. Do a flat. Yeah. I see, usually see. tell people, yeah. like, eight hours – maybe you know max 10 for a week in the winter time but then i'm i'm usually like on my weekends is when i'm mixing up soil okay. if i haven't already got a whole bunch ahead because i kind of yeah, like doing it watering's pretty minimal i mean it's not yeah. like you're out there every day you know we might water every third day or so depending on this you know the amount of light coming in and how hot it is but Right. November, December, January, we watered maybe once a week, and that was only what needed it. The humidity is and up there, the and key. the humidity keeps it pretty pretty damp, pretty moist without yeah. mold. So. And that's a good thing to slip in there while we're talking about that, is making sure that you don't overwater in there, because that added moisture can give you various kinds of problems, and the plants don't need it. And, you know, they really, I, I keep mine kind of on the dry side. I mean, not dry to the touch, but they're never, I try to never make them like dripping damp or anything like that. And it doesn't, And but I really love, and I, I think you guys probably do too, uh, doing the hand watering as opposed to trying to come up with some kind of contraption for an automated system. Besides just the added expense and maintenance of something like that. I think that the watering is that really key time when you're doing a lot of your observing on, you know, how healthy are the plants looking? Do I see any trouble spots? Um, I'm just kind of looking around the whole place and seeing, you know, do I see any signs of like uh, a leak somewhere where cold air is coming in or, you know, any kind of problem that might be around that's watering is a good time to be focused on, on those kinds of observations for me. I agree. Okay, so there's there's a couple more. I, maybe I'll ask a couple of questions at a time here. Uh, there's a note also um, just about the wasps that um, mites are tiny and they have a they they give bees some trouble. So just because yeah, but that's the purpose of a mite. That's yeah. not the purpose of a wasp. So the, these wasps are not harmful to the the bee population here. No, about. that's that's not when they're in the world for. Okay. Um, Okay, so there are a couple, I think, about black dirt, using black dirt in your soil mix, and then there's another one about um, uh, what you do with your spent soil, and also another clarifying question about the amount of uh, vermiculite you're using in your soil mix. Oh, the, in, in my soil mix, the vermiculite mm -hmm. is um, two gallons, two of those ice cream buckets. And the recipe for that soil mix is on our website also. And again, to find that, Greg, did you ever post the link? I did post it okay. in the chat. And again, you can just search for it on RSDP space DWG and you'll come to our site. So, yeah. Black uh, dirt in your mix? No. And the reason is because you want it fluffy. Yeah, it's too heavy. And you don't want to have to worry about, I mean, if it was a bagged black dirt, that might be okay, if you, especially if you're like working with raised beds or something like that. Um, but no, you really, you don't want this stuff to be compacted at all. And um, yeah, and the nice thing about that stuff too is like, I figure because the, the, the mineral fertilizer is slow release. And so it may very well be that after three to five cuttings of any planting that I've got in there, that there still could be viable fertilizer in that stuff. And it's really, it's a nice soil, obviously. So I take that outside and I set that beside my compost and I use it outside for other things, but I, I never bring anything that I have outside into the greenhouse. 
And I'm not sorry for that. I've never had a soil problem. The only problems I've ever had, I've never had, you know, all those nasty things that could happen in your soil if something from outside gets in there and there's nothing to um, knock it back. So um, yeah, no regrets there. What about you guys? Yeah, I wouldn't use topsoil, I guess, but um, just to clarify, Louise and I don't grow in the ground in that in their no. deep winter greenhouse. Um, I guess maybe in the future we'd plant some raised beds or something, but um, we got all we can do just to manage and keep going on the gutter system. So, uh, right. you know, it's, it's not like you're spending a lot of time per week, but um, you know, there's a lot to do. Yeah, there is. It's, yeah. It's basically one, one week a month that I do heavy seeding. You know, it's cleaning. I'm inspecting every time I'm out there, but one Almost one week a month is that. And all our used soil, I cut the tops off and all those greens, I feed the neighborhood guinea pigs for some of the kids. So they get a lot of greens that aren't good enough. The chickens get quite a bit in the winter time. So I cut it off, but all the roots in the soil, we put that in a raised bed and then hand work that in for where we need to raise beds in one of our other high tunnels. Do you so that's where that guinea goes. pigs? Yeah. I do bags of that food for guinea pigs. so cute. <laughs> it's, I, it's wonderful. They absolutely love it. So they, wow. don't, they don't like spinach, though. So <laughs> just, just letting you know, they don't like spinach. You know, I see a question here. I don't move plants out into um, hoop houses myself, but my interns that were in my greenhouse this year, just the very last of their stuff that's going out for their CSA is, is going out um, right now. And we are starting to play around with how far can we go with that season extension in the spring. So I actually, for the first year, this will make Greg so happy, I have, um, I'm growing tomatoes in my greenhouse, uh, trying to see if I can get some late June tomatoes. We've already got little, little red buttons, you know, on them. <laughs> And there's also some zucchini that's doing really well in there and some peppers and some eggplant. And these were varieties that were selected because they're um, greenhouse varieties. So we decided um, I'm just gonna leave them in there and let them keep growing so we can learn. I mean, the, the zucchini, I've already been harvesting zucchini off those plants and they're, they're flowering like crazy. I always, when I was first starting with greenhouses and, and with this greenhouse and trying that sort of stuff, I was not paying enough attention to um, keeping the air movement in there and trying to keep the temperature down. And I was having blossoms drop off the plants. And so I just thought, okay, that means you just can't do this. But with some prodding from some good and patient and determined comrades, it uh, became, um, a question that needed to be redressed and lo and behold it's working so far it's working we started all our vegetable sets in there starts in there Everything. and are moving them moving them out into our hoop houses right now actually a lot of them went into hoop houses with a row a layer of we call it ag fab um agricultural fabric it's like a four foot wide roll it uh, keeps bugs out and it also keeps the temperature about four degrees warmer. That's also what you saw on clipped onto the inside of the window. It's the same material. So oh, it does okay. uh, provide a little bit of shade shadow, but that's what we do. We uh, hoops in the ground. We either put them in one of the other tunnels, like the broccoli, cauliflower, cabbages. They mm -hmm. went out a month and a half ago. So have you noticed like, how much earlier does that allow you if you're transitioning from the deep winter greenhouse to hoop houses to the field? Oh, how much earlier of a crop are you getting by adding that deep winter greenhouse into that that series of movement? A good month. A good really. Month. Yeah. Well, I yeah, the plants are ready. It's the soil temperature it's that the soil temperature sometimes will limit. Out. Yeah, but the plant the plant itself is ready to go. It's ready to get out there in April. Yep. So you get broccoli a month earlier because of this? I would say so. Wow. Probably. 
I would say so. Other than you know, this has been this has been an odd spring too. I think it's going to depend a lot upon your spring. Last year, definitely not. This okay. year has been totally different. So can any of you okay. talk? Sorry to jump in. We're running a oh, little bit of time here. Um, can any of you talk about your water source? What are you using for water? We no, had a well was... drilled. Sorry, we had a well right. drilled, and that's what we're using. We have a day tank, right? Pressure tank in the back room and then use one hose, so. Mm. And I'm lucky, I live in town, I've got city water. Anytime I wanna know um, how my water looks, it, it gets tested monthly and I can get that from the city. But I, I did take one of those training um, things that, that tries to get uh, small vegetable farms and farmers to look at uh, safe practices with, with food and the biggest takeaway from that I had is they, they showed this pie graph and half of it was, um, you know, split into quarters. And it was talking about where E. coli usually shows up in, in food. And so one quarter of, of all E. coli outbreak is salad greens and the other quarter was microgreens so half of all of it comes from our crops and so my takeaway that i i talk to people about it is this this idea that you can't just go by like the omri level of water testing if you really want to make sure that when you're on a farm that you don't have any e coli they talked about how you know weather events that can impact the quality of your well water like if if somehow you get a lot more like we just had a freaking downpour out here for the last half hour and depending on where a well might be located you could get some runoff into that well and if you've got neighbors that are grazing cattle this could be a problem and so people need to to know that sometimes the minimum is not enough so water is is a really big deal if you're out on a farm and it's up to you to make sure that that water is not contaminated Definitely. We get ours checked. And too, whenever we do washing or anything like that, that's done with city water. Yeah, well, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. All right. So um, let's see what you can, maybe this is a, oh, oh yeah, here's a good one uh, that is relevant right here. You've talked a little bit about um, watering, but you can talk about water leaks perhaps and fungal growth, how you manage fungal growth and water leaks in your greenhouse. Water leaks? I'm not sure what that means. Well, if, if there's water leaking or if perhaps uh, condensation dripping onto your, your structures or into your, you know, the wooden sill or your plants or something like that. About fungus, you know, fungal growth. How do you control for fungal growth? Well, a lot of that has to do with not overwatering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then our interior paint is a non-mildew um, resistant paint. I can't remember exactly the elastomeric. name of it. It's an elastomeric paint um, that um, keeps away all the mildew and all that kind of good stuff also. At least the wall surfaces and ceiling anyway. We do have condensation. You could see that in the windows and the bottom of the windows and that and that was it's dark looking but so I think we'll have to put another coat of that elastomeric paint on that just because all the condensation does run down to that point, but then drips off and down onto the ground. But there's never water stains or anything like that on the concrete block. It's just on that one sash. Yeah, and I, I tend to be kind of envious of you guys that have the 2.0 greenhouses because they're more tight. They're so much tighter than mine as far as like with, you know, added heat or whatever. But with that comes that problem. My, my greenhouse, I think, is drafty enough. <laughs> I just don't have as much trouble with, uh, I don't get fungus. I don't get mold. Um, if anything, I get moss sometimes. And, and what I tell people is, you know, your greenhouse is talking to you just like your plants talk to you. It's telling you what's wrong if you just learn the language. And so when I see um, moss, it tells me there's not enough air circulation in that space. Oh, sure. And moss is easy to get rid of. You just need to have more air movement so that it's not nice and moist and sitting there going, well, we could grow moss here, you know, because, wow, did you hear that? 
I just, had, I just had a great big crack of lightning and thunder out here. Holy cats. I love summer. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it is just monitoring and paying attention. And then uh, my first thing would be to make sure that you've got plenty of, of air movement in those spots where you're seeing that. Um, if there's, if uh, early on, sometimes I would get a little bit of moss growing in a planter or two that I had let be there too long. Uh, Cause I was trying to get it to grow and it wasn't growing. And it's like, that's when, you know, you just got to dump it and start over. Do you ever use hydrogen peroxide to kill things like E. coli in the soil for your greens? In the soil? Uh, we use, um, we soak our sunflower seeds, okay? And they get one teaspoon, or excuse me, half a teaspoon in two cups of water for a 15 minute soak. And that's the only time I use hydrogen peroxide. And then that gets rinsed out and they'll after those so many minutes and that's it but that's the only time i've used hydrogen peroxide on anything i never have i do uh, use a light bleach solution when i'm cleaning my gutters yes that's it um we're running low on time but if um if you have a little bit of thought about uh growing fruit through the warm half of the year. I presume maybe, I don't know whether or not that means perennial fruit, but um, has anybody grown fruit through the warm half of the year and is this problematic in any way? Haven't tried. Never tried. Sorry. Sounds like work, I wanna be outside. <laughs> um, here's another quick, not probably quick one, but why not use uh, grow lights as a backup heat system? Grow lights is a backup heat system? Sure. You know, if there's putting, if you have grow lights and they're putting off some heat, can that, can that help heat up your greenhouse? You mean like those big halogen running back and forthy kind of ones? Mm. Grow lights? Just say. Because most of the grow lights these days don't oh. generate a lot of heat because that's waste, that's considered wasted energy. Mm. If it's a light, I would think you'd use a light to be light, and then you would use some other source uh, of source that's meant to be heat for heat. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think you could have a, enough grow lights to make a serious impact on the heat in a greenhouse in the winter. No. Am I wrong? Shane, jump in. No, I don't think you're wrong. I don't think you're wrong. Um, I, I think the technology has gone away from, you know, you. 10 years ago, you touch an incandescent bulb and it was hotter than the Dickens. But mm -hmm. nowadays, I think the technology has kind of changed that whole scenario with energy consumption and stuff like that, that um, yeah. light bulbs don't produce heat as much as they used to. That might be a good question, though, to run past Dan Handeen if, if the person who asked that question will be sitting in on one of his webinars. I'm because, here. you know, that sort of, oh, is Dan's here? Yep. Yes. Uh, an answer. Jump in, Dan. <laughs> well, it would be part of it. I, I, I think you guys are right on, though. Uh, generally, the, the lights these days are much more efficient at making light instead of light and heat. So, um, yeah, it would meet, you know, it would help offset part of the heating load, but I would still definitely put in some kind of additional supplementary backup heat source. Thanks. All right, we are at 3.58, and I've got a couple of uh, uh, ending slides to show. So um, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions. There's still a few straggling questions. For those of you who still have pending questions, I'd suggest um, if you want to have a conversation about any of these or any of the other questions, check out our Deep Winter Greenhouse website, DWGUMN. You Google those two things, and you'll, you'll go right to it. There will be links to our contact information in that website and also a link to our Facebook group where you can go uh, join up and have conversations with all sorts of deep winter greenhouse producers around Minnesota, the Dakotas, Wisconsin, and Canada, and perhaps the world. So um, there's good resources available to get these questions answered. Um, and I think with that, I'm going to come back and share my screen again. So I figure this out and then wrap us up. Thanks for coming, everybody.
if you can see my can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay, here. Click. So um, there we go. Um, tomorrow, 2 p.m., we'll be talking about the new farm scale deep winter greenhouse design, June 3rd. And then in addition to that, on Friday, June 5th, we'll be uh, making up for our postponed uh, deep winter greenhouse design. So hopefully one of these days will fit into your schedule. Um, if not, all of these will be available on our website when we're all done and you'll be able to come back and uh, view these webinars. So here is a, that website. If you don't wanna Google it, you can go to z.umn.edu backslash dwg2020 and then you can get to our resource website. And with that, I would like to thank you all for joining us and we will close this out now and hopefully I'll see you all tomorrow. I'll be there. Thank you thank for you having everybody. us. Bye. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.